Making pixel art can oftentimes be a battle between wanting more detail versus having more clarity. With modern pixel art titles getting more and more advanced in their techniques to display beautiful worlds, it can be difficult to try and keep up without showing the shortcomings of your own skills. Today, I'd like to go over how I got just a little bit better at pixel art by taking note of my mistakes and learning from them. Hi there! Welcome back to the third installment of the Everbloom devlog series. If you're wondering why my voice sounds significantly higher than usual, it's because I'm a different person. I'm the artist working on Everbloom. You might have seen some of my replies to a few of your comments signing off as Art Guy to distinguish myself from our social media manager's responses. I'll pop into these devlog videos from time to time when I feel like it's necessary. This way, when the topic around some of the art for the game becomes more personal, the videos feel more natural. Anyways, without further ado, let's talk about this cabin. When I initially designed this home, I wanted to give a sense of wonder and completeness. Having multi-layered floors with intertwining objects was a given. Without going too deeply into lore, the main idea is that the protagonist somehow finds himself with a rundown home that appears to have been abandoned for quite a long time. Making buildings look rundown is pretty easy. Have some overgrown foliage here, and some holes in the roof there, and we have ourselves a nice vacant property. Maybe even throw in some cobwebs for extra spice. The color scheme for the house was chosen based off of some reference photos I found. I knew I wanted some combination of blue and orange, as I had seen some really pretty examples of buildings with those combinations of colors. As for the rest of the house though, I tried prioritizing clarity over color choice which in theory is a good idea, since you're not going to be able to see good color if they're not properly drawn with clarity in mind, but drawing this way became a little bit of an issue later. During the entire process of drawing the exterior, I had to constantly remind myself to trust the process. At no point that I feel like I was moving in the right direction, just that I had to apply some shapes and colors and tinker with it until it looked all right. The biggest problem with a process like this is that it is infinitely more time consuming. From the beginning of this time lapse to the end, it took me around 17 days of full-time drawing. This usually isn't a problem for me as I've worked on month-long projects in the past, but during early development on a project such as Everbloom, my skills could have been used for other things that had a higher priority. I'm not sure if 20 days is about the right amount of time it takes for this sort of drawing, but I know had I planned things out a little better, I would have finished sooner. So here's where I ended up stopping. And it looks... alright? By no means does it look bad. Again, given enough tinkering, your drawing will eventually look better. But right now there are some issues with it that I'll have to revisit at some other point in development. Those issues being clarity, a lack of shape, and a lacking color palette. If I'm just a wee bit nicer to myself, none of these issues are deal-breaking. Ultimately, I still think this cabin looks pretty nice, but that's sort of the worst part when it comes to these kinds of things. You eventually get to a point where things look okay, and you want to push it further to looking amazing, but all the glaring issues are gone and now you're just left with smaller, less noticeable issues and going, so what's wrong with it? After studying the image closely and not wanting to repeat the same mistakes, I now have a basic outline of what the problems are but how do I prevent them from happening again as I move towards working on the inside? The first thing I wanted to tackle was the layout of the room. There are an infinite number of ways to design a floor layout. I almost never draw anything without multiple references, and when it comes to drawing interiors, there are very few people who do it better than the students at FCD school. I don't know what they teach you guys over there, but please, can I have, please? A couple common themes I noticed within their artworks is the varying floor heights combined with interesting shapes that jut and flow throughout the room, even if it doesn't really make any practical sense. My motto for designing anything is, does it look cool? It stays. Does it make sense? Who cares? It looks cool. I like this philosophy because it's not as chaotic as it first seems. Of course, a sci-fi alien warship probably won't make much sense under any context within Everbloom, but a water wheel built inside the home to power some components might. Is it practical? Not really. But it makes just enough sense within the confines of this universe to not be immersion breaking. 
My process for designing the inside is pretty simple, as long as you know the steps. First, find what shades of black and white look best together. This is called value. If you can't make black and white look good together, no amount of color will save you. The main purpose of this step is to fix the clarity issue the exterior had. Next, we put some flat colors down. It's okay for things not to look great at this stage. We'll detail them in the next steps. But before we continue, we encounter yet another issue from the last drawing, and that was a lacking color palette. While I was working on the outside part of the cabin, there was very little color coordination, and I found it really difficult to choose colors that worked well together. The way I circumvented this was by picking a color palette instead of choosing colors off the fly. But how do you choose a color palette? I actually didn't. I scrolled through Pinterest for a little while until I found an image that gave me the same mood as what I wanted the inside to feel like, and used a website called Coolers, Colors? Coolers? to automatically create my color palette based off the colors within the image. For the sake of transparency, we're not sponsored by them or anything, it's just what I used. Now that I have a color palette, I can start dropping in some flat colors to every object in the scene. The way you do this without affecting any of the values you just spent all that time laying down is by using Photoshop's blend modes. Where I stray from traditional pixel art is I use the color palette more as a guide rather than a rule. Oftentimes, you'll see pixel artists pick some combination of colors and strictly adhere to it. There's nothing wrong with this approach, I just prefer having a wide selection of color. After that, I began drawing in some direct lighting. Where this is drawn is mostly dictated by where the cast shadows are. If there's a big shadow casted by a desk, then it'll more than likely have some direct lighting. And finally, to add a little bit of character, I apply some finishing touches such as texturizing, ambient occlusion, and rim lighting if necessary. Something that I haven't touched on yet is how I handled my layering. When working on the outside, I knew that a lot of things were going to need to stay separate so that they could be exported individually as game objects. The problem with this is that it makes the creation process really repetitive and unintuitive by having your Photoshop project become bloated with hundreds of layers. For the inside, I did a complete 180 and stuck strictly to one layer for 95% of the image. The only time I deviate from this is for things that would be fairly annoying to work around if they aren't separated on their own layer. Not only was this much more enjoyable to work in, but I felt myself fiddling around with objects and layers way less, which enabled me to just drop in brush strokes way more smoothly. My color coordination improved as well as I was no longer laser focused on whatever one singular object I was working on within that layer. After some final touch-ups, here's the final image. I think this method of work speaks for itself as the picture quality is massively improved while being finalized at a significantly faster pace at taking only 11 days instead of 17. To recap, what I did to improve my pixel art for Everbloom was I took notes of issues I had while drawing, studied the finished image and looked for flaws. So in my case, it was the lack of clarity, shape, and poor color palette, as well as the process taking way too long. Came up with potential solutions, those solutions being gathering plenty of good references, starting the drawing in grayscale to check and correct values more easily, picking a color palette that has proven to work well, and drawing with only one layer instead of hundreds, and repeat. This will be a forever ongoing process for any artist. The improvement cycle continues on and on until we decide to stop. That's what makes it fun. I'm pretty happy with how things turned out, and it's always a good feeling to have that direct positive feedback after noticing a problem and fixing it when you give it another go. I hope this video was of some use to you, or at the very least was entertaining. A small announcement we'd like to make is the discontinuation of monthly devlogs. We'll definitely try to keep up with posting frequently, but game dev takes a lot of time, and we'd prefer to show off things when they're at a more complete stage rather than a half-baked product that would just disappoint. For those who are wanting a bit more insight into the actual development part of these devlogs, currently, we're working on a lot of back-end systems that will help propel us into making more advanced features. We really want to save these features for a more dedicated devlog, so for now, a few smaller things we've developed are scene transitions from between the houses inside and out, transparency for when the player walks behind an object, and a myriad of bug fixes.
Our next vlog is going to focus on enemies and combat, along with a plethora of other features that didn't fit well into this video. This includes game features such as enemy AI with a custom state machine and custom pathfinding. These can be used to create fully functional enemies with distinct personalities. We'll be showing off some of these enemies in the next video, so be sure to subscribe to be notified of when we release it. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and share. Otherwise, see you soon.